Hello everyone and welcome to our service from St Mary's in Ely and for all the churches in the Ely team. My name's Chris and I'm the Rector of St Mary's and the team and I'm so pleased that you're joining with our worship today. We're trying to play our part in sharing Jesus' love with every home in Ely and the surrounding villages. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, you are welcome here. Although there's clearly some light at the end of the Covid tunnel, we remain online only for the moment and we'll make the decision to go back when it's clearly safe to do so and when the Prime Minister indicates that there's been some real change. Meanwhile, we remain thankful for all those key workers, carers, medical staff, school staff and council workers who are keeping us safe. Thank you. After today's sermon, where we're looking at Jesus' Last Supper, I'd like to invite you to take part in a prayer activity by creating four prayer stations where you are at home. So I wonder if I could ask you in a moment to pause the video and to get four things, and I'll put a list on the screen. The first is a, a bowl of water. I've got mine here, bowl of, uh, bowl of water. Some bread or some crackers or biscuits. I've got a loaf of bread here, freshly baked this morning from the bake shop across the road from the vicarage. Some juice or wine or sherry or grapes, uh, uh, something like that, and then put them all on a table. I've got a table here, but I can't quite show you that at the moment. So I'll pause for a moment to give you time to go and get them and the list will be up on the screen. Thank you for doing that. And now our opening prayer. Please say out loud the words in bold. Faithful one whose word is life, come with saving power to free our praise, inspire our prayer and shape our lives. For the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's join in together now with our first song, Praise is Rising in which we proclaim that God is worthy of all our praises.
And now Aram Kim will read from the Bible, after which Piers will offer our talk. Uh, Aram is a student at Cambridge University who is with us on placement. Welcome, Aram. It's lovely to have you with us. 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, for when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and ill, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further instructions. Good morning. My name is Piers Coots, and I'm a licensed lay minister based at St Mary's here in Ely. Today we're looking at our next reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthian church. Today, it's his teaching on the Lord's Supper. I'm not sure what you know about the Apostle Paul, but I can tell you this, you wouldn't want to be told off by him. So I'm sure that when the Christians in Corinth got to this part of the letter, their hearts sank. Have a look at verse 17. In the following directives, says Paul, I have no praise for you. It's as if you're at school, You've been called to meet with the head of year and they begin by saying, I'm not impressed at all by what I've heard about your behaviour. And then Paul takes it further, continuing in verse 17. For your meetings do more harm than good. Your meetings do more harm than good. Images of the chaotic Handforth Parish Council come to mind. The way that the Corinthian Christians organised what we call a communion service was very different from ours. They met in someone's home, not in a separate building, and they had a full meal, not just a token piece of bread or wafer and a sip of wine. But that's not what was bothering Paul. His criticism was that the division between rich and poor people, which afflicts every society, including our own today, had spread through from their culture and had infected the church, where such a prejudice should never be seen. If ever there was a place where all should be equal, it was in this recollection of Jesus' death. It is a demonstration of Jesus' sacrifice, of his being one with all humanity. It's where the immortal Son of God submitted himself to mortality. 
In the light of this, we recognise our unworthiness, our inadequacy, and acknowledge that our acceptance depends on God's grace alone. How could we allow questions of status, class or race to invade our act of remembrance of this occasion, this truth? The problems that Paul describes here stem from the way that such occasions were held then, and they don't convert directly into our situation. But the general principle still is absolutely clear, and we must watch out for it too. And it's this. Are we excluding any type of person, either deliberately or by accident, from being part of our church family? Have any of God's children, perhaps due to their race, language or status, have any of them been made to feel out of place in our Christian community? Do we ever, to use Paul's terrible phrase, humiliate some people just because they're different? The notice on St Mary's church door, at least when I last looked, said, whoever you are, wherever you come from, you're welcome here. And that's a great sentiment. But we must ask, is it actually true? Self-examination like this can make us feel uncomfortable, but it's precisely what Paul commands us to do. Have a look at verses 28 to 29. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Stern words. Today we tend to personalize this command to take it as applying to us as individuals, requiring us to check our hearts carefully before we take Holy Communion. And it's right for us to do that. But look more closely at the context here. In verse 22, Paul asks, do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who are poor? He's saying that if we discriminate against any of God's children, then we despise the church of God. And remember, one of Paul's favourite metaphors for the church of God is the body of Christ. Then without pausing for breath, Paul moves straight on to talk about the Bread and Wine Remembrance Festival instituted by Jesus, in which he said of the bread, this is my body. Paul is combining the two uses of the phrase, the body of Christ, and highlighting how destructive discrimination is within the church. Verses 18 and 20, Paul says, In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. So, when you come to eat together, it is not the Lord's Supper you're eating. Allowing such differences, such divisions, such discrimination when you hold this memorial, means you have invalidated the whole ceremony. In Paul's words, it is not the Lord's Supper that you're eating. And the words we read in verses 28 to 29 can also be read in that way. Yes, they mean that lack of reverence for Christ's sacrifice for us, symbolised in bread and wine, is not discerning the body of Christ. But so too is allowing discrimination to become entrenched within the church's culture, not discerning the body of Christ in its other meaning. And this is also something which can lead us into judgment. If we are part of a more high church tradition, which reads these words as being about the act of communion itself being sacred, an action that requires self-examination, respect and reverence, then that is a correct way of reading Paul's, te Paul's teaching. If we're more of a low church persuasion, emphasising the importance of equality, being accessible, treating everybody the same, then we're right here too, because I reckon Paul is saying that as well. For Paul, these two aspects are both vital and indivisible, joined together in the way we remember Christ's sacrifice and death. Well, these are clear warnings, and they highlight some of the things we must work hard to avoid. Is there also a more positive message which we can take from this passage? 
What does it say about the strength and power of this memorial of the Lord's Supper? It's interesting that this passage and a few verses in the preceding chapter are the only clues we have as to what Paul's views were on the Lord's Supper. And this letter was almost certainly written before the four Gospels were compiled. It's therefore a unique glimpse into early church practice. So what does it tell us about how they did things then? Well, first of all, we know that the Lord's Supper was part of their regular worship. As their meetings mostly took place in someone's house, that's where they will have held this memorial as well. And it also seems to have taken place as part of a complete meal rather than a separate ceremony. And these two facts together may give us a clue as to where things had gone wrong in Corinth. If you're planning to meet in someone's house, which house would you choose? For practical reasons, it would probably be one of the bigger ones where there's enough space. Who has the biggest houses? The richer people. Can you see how things might start to go wrong here? When you have people round to your house, do you remember how we used to do that? You obviously want to look after them and make them feel comfortable, which is great. But perhaps you might also want to impress them with your nice house. Can you see how genuine motives, wanting to share my house and food with my Christian brothers and sisters, can turn into something less worthy? Let me show off how rich and posh I am. And it's only a small step then to, in Paul's phrase, humiliating those who are less well off than you. So this early church did meet to share bread and wine, but as Paul has pointed out in detail, they were doing it in the wrong way. Secondly, we also know that this was an important part of their faith. This memorial originated from Jesus' last meal with his friends. The words Paul quotes here are some of Jesus' last words, pretty much his final teaching to them, and they include a command. Do this in remembrance of me. Looking back on the last meal you have with someone you love can be an incredibly poignant memory, especially if, as in this case, you know at the time that it's going to be their last meal. Even if Jesus hadn't told them to remember this moment, they would have done so for the rest of their lives. So to take something so precious and turn it either into an occasion for eating and drinking too much, or worse still, a chance to put down some people, well, this would be disgraceful. This is why Paul is so vehement in his criticism of their behaviour. Remember what he calls it, humiliating those who are financially struggling, sinning against the body and blood of the Lord, eating and drinking judgment on themselves. If you do these things, says Paul, it's not the Lord's Supper. So it was something that the early church did, and Paul felt it was vital that they shouldn't misuse it. What message can we take from this for our church life today? Well, firstly, if it was important for the Christians then, it should also be important for us today. And it's something we're missing out on during lockdown. This shared experience of worship and connection with Christ isn't possible for us at the moment. Don't get me wrong, I'm not questioning the decision to suspend our services. I know there are good reasons for it. But we do need to recognise that it means something important is missing. We know that we miss meeting together with our friends, but we need to remember that we're also missing out on meeting together with the Lord in this way. In my view, this is one of the strongest reasons for wanting to open the church building again as soon as it's safe to do so. Socially distanced worship may only be a shadow of our normal life together, scattered across a half empty building, unable to sing or even greet each other properly, but it is still a vital part of our worship and we need it. Secondly, I think we can learn something positive from the early Christian practice. Perhaps because of the misuses highlighted by Paul, the church has become super careful in the way that it organises and controls communion. We have pushed our memorial of the Lord's Supper a long way along the spectrum towards awe, reverence and mystery. 
There's certainly no danger of drunkenness or overeating in our services today. But is there a danger of having lost the family feeling of a communal meal held together? Some of the most moving communions I recall have been with small groups of friends in everyday domestic settings. Reverential and respectful, yes, but also close, friendly and totally natural. It would be good to recapture some of that emphasis too once we're able to meet up again. And finally, I want to just touch on the most important question of all and ask exactly what is it that's happening when we come together in this way to remember and proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again? Now, people far wiser than me have written entire books on this question and I don't claim to be able to answer it in full. However, it seems to me that communion needs to be seen both as a human and a heavenly event. It's a combination of us joining together as a group with one heart and mind, and it's a meeting with Christ together in the way he told us to do. I'm going to finish today with some images of communion in different settings and some wise words from Bishop Tom Wright to think about. And after we've seen these slides, we'll move on to our prayer stations activity as a way of remembering Jesus together. So some words from Bishop Tom Wright. Communion is the moment at which the past event, Jesus' death, comes forward to live again in the present. And the future moment of the Lord's return comes backwards in time to challenge us in the present. So hopefully at this point you have your four prayer stations, your aids to prayer, a bowl of water, bread or something like it, juice or wine or something like it, and something that can act as a table. Let's start with the bowl of water. Just going to get that in my hands here. As we come to remember Jesus' death, St Paul says, examine your motives, test your heart, Come to this meal in holy awe. So let's be honest with God about our way of life, our shortcomings, the state of our heart. And let's take a moment of silence. And we offer now our prayer of confession. Please say the words in bold. Sometimes we forget that Jesus is a gift to all of us and we ignore him. Sometimes we forget that Jesus came for everyone and we snub some people. Sometimes we forget that Jesus gave us talents and we don't play our part in his plan. May the God of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself and cleanse us and set us free to flourish in our faith. Amen. And now as I offer the prayer of forgiveness, can I invite you to wash your hands in the water as a symbol of cleansing, a symbol of Jesus removing your wrongdoing, purifying you, mind, body and soul. Heavenly Father, in the power of your Spirit, forgive in us what has gone wrong. Repair in us what is wasted. Reveal in us what is good. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So, probably a good idea to dry hands off at this point. And now consider the table itself, which everything else is placed on. The table where we all come together. The great leveller where we all gather in the same way and where we all receive the same gifts from God. Can I invite you to close your eyes? 
Let's imagine walking together to the front of the church to receive communion. Who is with you at the table? Imagine God drawing us together to be one at the table, to be one body, the body of Christ. Invite Jesus to draw you into this community of saints because it's where you belong. It's where you find your true home. We thank you, Father, for the table to which you draw us. And now take the, the bread in your hands, or maybe a cracker or biscuit or whatever else you have with you. If you baked it yourself, it might have been in your hands before. Having purified us, God now wants to transform us. He wants to give us spiritual nourishment. He wants to cultivate our faith. So let's eat a little of this life-giving bread and imagine God providing everything we need for a living, vibrant, lifelong walk with him. Let's take a little of that bread in silence. Finally now, let's take the juice or the wine, representing Christ's blood, which was shed as he gave his life for us, as he sacrificed everything for us, his children. And just as the wine matures over time, we pray that we would mature in our faith. We pray that we would own that sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And in turn, we pray that we will introduce Jesus to those around us. Let's finish with the Lord's Prayer. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. And as we continue to remember the Last Supper, we sing now together how deep the Father's love for us. Please join in at home. It's dying breath that roars.
I'm now going to hand over to Andrew Wickham to lead us in our prayers today. Andrew and his family have recently joined us at St Mary's, having recently returned to the UK. So welcome Andrew and your family and thanks for joining us today. We will now spend a few minutes in prayer. You might like to close your eyes or find somewhere quiet so that you can focus. Let's pray. Loving and eternal God, in the middle of this crisis that goes on and on and seems to consume our every waking moment, it is right to pause and be still for just a few minutes in your presence. For you are here among us, even as we are scattered and not gathered together. It is right to give you thanks and praise for your presence with us for ye are involved in all things and worthy of great praise. In our pain and struggle, you are there. In the giving of great gifts to the church, like a pastoral heart, musical ability, gifts of administration and technology, and so many other things, you are there. In the science behind vaccinations, you are there. In giving strength to face another day, you are there. In grief and sorrow and precious moments of joy, Lord, you are there and we thank you. And perhaps each person, each one of us, might like to just quickly reflect on at least one thing we are thankful for from this past week in a brief time of silence. Prayers now for the community. We thank you, Lord, that we can freely worship in this way. If not actually in person, then in spirit we are in communion together. Please bless our leaders in the Ely team and inspire each one of us to support and to pray for these leaders as best we can. And Lord, please look kindly upon Ely during this time. So many businesses closed, so many school children at home, teachers and medical professionals, and so many others working so hard, and also so many lonely people with no family or friends to call on them. We believe in your comfort and consolation, and we pray for this community. And finally, let us remember who we are as Christians, sent into the world as light to practice love of God and neighbour. Please remind and inspire us, Lord, that we must not grow weary of doing good in whatever limited way we are able during this time. For in the kingdom of God, even the smallest act of kindness might turn out to have the biggest impact. Thank you for being with us, Lord, and continue to guide us forwards, we pray. And these prayers are said in the name of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And finally, we pray our giving prayer, offering the money we give to all the team churches for their work in the community and amongst our mission partners. Together we pray. Generous God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, we offer our gifts to you with joy, symbol of the work you have given us to do. Use them, use us, in the service of your world, to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. If you do want to start giving regularly to St Mary's or one of the village churches, please do get in contact with your local treasurer uh, or in St Mary's case, visit our website for the giving section. Thank you. And so as we come towards the end of our service this morning, let's sing one last worship song together. Your grace is enough. Please do join in.
Thanks once again for joining us this morning and a big thank you to everybody who's participated today. We take a break from the Corinthians series now for Lent when we'll be looking at the characteristics of Jesus for the next five weeks. If you aren't part of a home group and fancy trying things out, Jeremy and I will be running a pop-up group for five weeks on Tuesday evenings from 7.30 on the 23rd of February. So that's five weeks, Tuesday evenings, uh, 7.30 from the 23rd of February, a pop-up Lent home group. Please do join in if you'd like to. So a final blessing. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favour and give you his peace. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Goodbye everyone.